on best practices in implementing peer-to-peer -peer support programs for health professionals who are emotionally affected by a patient safety incident. That's right. I said this is the fourth webinar in the series. If you missed one of the webisodes, please visit patientsafetyinstitute.ca to view the recorded sessions. We also invite you to join us for the final webinar in this series. On Tuesday, October 29th, we will launch the Safe Spaces Toolkit right in the middle of Canadian Patient Safety Week. CPSI is working with our partners to establish a peer-to-peer -peer support network and expert advisory committee. When you exit the webinar, please complete the polling question to express your interest for joining this network. My name is Christopher Thrall. I am the Communications Officer with CPSI. I would like to welcome you on behalf of our partners who you will see on screen in just two seconds. There they are, I hope. No, I didn't have the ball, but hopefully they'll be up on screen for you in just a moment. Uh, and welcome as well on behalf of our technical host, Gina Peck from CPSI. Before we begin, I would like to introduce our speakers today. We will start with Margaret Armutlu, who joined the Canadian Patient Safety Institute in 2017 as a Senior Program Manager and is the lead for the Psychological Health and Safety of Healthcare Workers Program. Welcome, Margaret, to the webinar. Margaret will be followed by Brenda Roos. Brenda has been working with Health Canada's Occupational and Critical Incident Stress Management for the last two years, supporting nurses who work in First Nations com communities across Canada. Brenda has worked with Health Canada for 31 years, where she spent most of her career working with First Nations and Inuit Health Branch. Thank you for joining us, Brenda. Brenda will be followed by Lynn Robertson, who is a nurse by trade, having worked in Alberta Health Services for over 31 years. The last 21 of those years have been in workplace health and safety, where Lynn is the Director of Special Projects and Professional Practice. Welcome, Lynn. We are also happy to have La Dr. Adrienne Godet, a physician advisor at the PAMQ QPHP since 2011, and a member of the Forum of Canadian Physician Health Programs. She has worked in child, adolescent, and adult psychiatry in several university-affiliated positions in Quebec and Nova Scotia. Thank you so much for joining us, Adrienne. Finally, Kelly McNaughton is the Program Manager of the Peer Support and Trauma Response Team at SickKids in Toronto. This is the first hospital-based peer program in Canada, which includes physicians, that provides support following second victim events and trauma. Kelly was a trauma manager with oversight of national and global response for a national EAP and team lead for their clinical operations during 9-11. She is currently engaged in a study of the incidents of PTSD in nursing with Memorial University. Welcome, Kelly, to the webinar. If you missed part of this webinar or want to share your learnings with others in your team or organization, please know that it is being recorded and will be available on our website within the next week. Please write your questions in the Q&A box on your screen or chat them directly to me, Christopher Thrall. They will be compiled and provided to our speakers at the end of the call. If you run into IT difficulties, please connect with us in the chat box and we would be happy to assist. And now, with our introductions and orientation out of the way, I would like to invite Margaret to open the discussion on creating a safe space. Margaret, you may be muted right now. We would love to hear your lovely voice. Thank you, Christopher. I you hope bet. You can all hear me now. Um, you bet. I'm going to advance the slides, and it, it appears that the slides got stuck there for a moment, but here's our CPSI team and uh, the guest speakers that um, Christopher very kindly introduced to you on the screen. So I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to speak to you about our uh, program on Psychological Health and Safety of Healthcare Workers, and welcome you to this uh, fourth in a series of now five webinars. Um, the um, second victim phenomenon, uh, which uh, was coined by Albert Wu um, uh, well over a decade ago, has since um, been uh, expanded in scope, and we are looking at it in terms of not just healthcare providers who are on the sharp end of patient safety incidents, but looking at it from the scope of healthcare workers um, who are impacted um, through their experiences in healthcare 
and are distressed uh, for various reasons, um, provision of care management. And uh, recognizing that um, the um, health care um, and the health and safety of healthcare workers um, has a direct impact on patient safety. Through the course of um, this work, CPSI did um, work and pull together folks uh, with expertise to develop a, um, a guidelines on confidentiality and legal privilege. Um, we did have um, three previous webinars that looked um, at the various components of our work, including the guide on confidentiality, uh, looked at um, the um, a report on the perceptions of healthcare workers, clearly identifying the need for a peer-to-peer -peer support program, and um, as well a global environmental scan of um, programs across the globe. And, um, and today what we've done is we've pulled together um, expertise from across Canada to look at some recommendations for Canadian best practices for peer support programs. Uh, you will um, see that we will have an upcoming webinar um, at the end of October, and we will speak to that later in the program, uh, that will then share with you a, a toolkit for peer, review, uh, peer support programs, and we will be launching uh, an expert advisory committee and a network to help support um, healthcare organizations across Canada who are interested in developing peer support programs. And we have also, um, in partnership with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, um, uh, we are working with both the CSA and HSO and, uh, and others to really look at influencing uh, practices, policies, and standards um, around programs specifically. So with that, I will um, go to our next slide and speak to you about this work today. So we're really very excited to share with you um, the, uh, the report on guidelines for best practices. And um, today uh, we have, as, as you heard, four guest speakers who will present the key elements of the best practices guidelines. And so with doing so, we hope that you will have a better understanding of these best practices guidelines for peer support programs and learn about the key elements needed to establish, activate, and sustain a peer-to-peer -peer support program and be able to explain the role of peer supporters and of managers and leadership in, in terms of what is needed to really sustain and, you know, and help um, peer support program develop establish and develop in your organization. Now, um, this work, I'm pleased to say, it's really, um, what we did was in developing this work, we went out and we um, went through some of our contacts. The Mental Health Commission um, was also a guide in helping point out some expertise across the country. Uh, we did our own um, internet search to see what existed um, across Canada through word of mouth as well, um, meeting folks at various national conferences, we were able to then identify 12 Canadian stakeholders from literally coast to coast with expert knowledge and experience in the area of peer-to-peer -peer support programs. These folks were brought together and they really helped form a working group on peer-to-peer -peer support programs in healthcare. This working group shared their challenges, their successes, their lessons learned, and together worked to develop the Canadian Best Practices Guidelines for Peer-to-Peer -peer Support Programs for Healthcare Workers. So we are really pleased to present to you our four representatives of this working group who will present the key elements of the Canadian Best Practices Guidelines for Peer-to-Peer <clears throat> -peer Support for Healthcare Workers. And um, with that, I just want to, <clears throat> excuse me, share with you share with you the list <clears throat> of contributors. Um, these are the 12 individuals who uh, we did engage from, uh, from coast to coast across Canada. And I want to um, send a shout out to each of them for their support through this process and their input into these guidelines. And um, 
I, you have that there, so I'm not going to name everyone today, but I want to proceed with welcoming Brenda Roos from Health Canada, the Occupational Critical Incident Stress Management Program, to start with um, explaining um, some of the elements of our best practice. Brenda, over to you. Brenda, we'll just have you unmute your mic, if you could, please. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, beautiful. Thank you so much, Brenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Margaret, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, today, uh, I'm going to, to talk a bit about peer support programs. And well, as we have seen from the scoping review, there are many variations in the meaning and or composition of peer support programs. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, the disparity is likely the result of the grassroots nature of the peer support programs, where each organization develops and implements a program that is suited to their structure and adapted to the specific needs of their staff. This can clearly be seen in the various programs involved in the uh, tr uh, development of this uh, tool, such as the OSISM program where I work. We only support nurses. The BC Emergency Health Services program focuses on first responder paramedics and dispatchers. The Quebec Medical Council support physicians. And the hospital-based programs often reach a broader range of healthcare employees. At the heart of any peer support program, however, is the desire to embed and sustain a psychologically safe environment where those who are part of the healthcare organization feel supported by their peers and the organization when they experience distress at work. <clears throat> a peer support program includes any program that provides non-clinical emotional support to health professionals, and in some cases, other individuals who work, volunteer, or train at an organization who are experiencing emotional distress and this support is provided by a peer. The need for emotional support can be the result of a patient safety incident, an event or circumstance that could have resulted or did result in unnecessary harm to the patient. There are three types of patient safety incidents. Harmful incident, a patient safety incident that resulted in harm to the patient, and this term replaces the previous preventable adverse event. Near miss, a patient safety incident that did not reach the patient and therefore no harm resulted. Or a no harm incident in which the um, patient safety incident that reached the patient but no discernible harm resulted. A critical incident or trauma as defined by the sick kids policy, any sudden unpredictable event that occurs during the course of carrying out day-to-day -day duties or activities that poses physical or psychological threat to the safety or well-being of an individual or group of individuals. Examples might include unexpected death of a patient, suicide of a colleague, a workplace accident resulting in critical injury to a staff member, internal or external disasters, mass casualty situations such as a plane crash or multi-vehicle crash, life-threatening illness, injury or untimely death of staff or coworker, natural or man-made disasters such as tornadoes, flooding or hurricanes, any incident charged with profound emotion most recently, the mass shootings in the United States and in Toronto. Other work-related stress, now these exclude the human resources, 
such as job action or performance. Examples include work environment resulting in assault, harassment, or violence involving staff or patients and or family, workplace conflict, workplace reorganization or downsizing, complaints or lawsuits lodged against staff, cumulative stress, work-life balance issues, staff experiencing compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma, or events that may attract media attention. Primary values of a peer support program include self-determination, self-resiliency, and equality. The belief that each person knows the path to recovery that is most suitable for them and that it is the peer's choice to engage in a peer support relationship. Self-compassion, the belief that empathy increases self-compassion, minimizes moral injury, and reduces stigma around seeking help. Mutuality and empathy, the belief that all involved in the peer support relationship can benefit from the reciprocity and understanding that comes from lived experience. And recovery, hope, and empowerment. The belief that there is power in hope and positivity and that these can aid in recovery. The next few slides will reflect guiding principles of a peer support program. Respect where each individual is at in their journey towards empowerment and or recovery and recognize that while peer supporters may have lived experience, the beliefs and healing paths of peers may not be the same as their own. Help peers to normalize or destigmatize their distress and encourage resilience through compassion and self-compassion. Help peers to determine their own direction. Work with peers to identify and explore options and work with them to take steps forward on their own rather than helping by doing it for them. Create a peer relationship that is open and flexible and maintain the focus on the peers and their needs. Ask yourself, are we in a safe place in the client's eyes? <clears throat> Focus on positivity and on the peer's journey to a more hopeful, healthy, and full life, rather than focusing on symptoms, diagnoses, or objectives set by someone other than the peer. Share aspects of lived experience in a manner that is helpful to the client, demonstrating compassionate understanding and inspiring hope for recovery. Self-care is essential to the well-being of the peer supporter as well. Take care to recognize the need for health, personal growth, and resiliency when working as a peer supporter. Use communication skills and strategies to foster an open, honest, non-judgmental relationship that validates the peer's feelings and cultivates trust. <clears throat> Empower peers to find their path towards a healthier outcome and encourage them to disengage from the peer support relationship when the time is right for the peer. Respect professional boundaries with the peer and with other professionals should they become involved. It might be useful to establish whether relationship is a short-term or long-term one. Collaborate with others community partners, mental health professionals, leadership, other stakeholders whenever appropriate. No personal limits during crises and other times. Seek assistance when appropriate. Peer support work can be intense and experiences very challenging. And as such, peer supporters need to understand the importance of taking care of themselves. Maintain high ethics and personal boundaries to avoid harming the peer or the reputation of peer support. Participate in continuing education 
and personal development to learn skills and strategies to assist in peer support work. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brenda. Can everyone hear me? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Lynn. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. I'm going to be touching on the topics of building and operation, operationalizing a peer support program. Um, to start, I think it's really important that uh, work be done in advance of pulling a peer team together. And part of that is establishing a need for a program. Uh, it's really important to make sure that, that this, is, this type of program is something that the organization wants and that workers want. There's many, many ways in, uh, in doing a, a needs assessment. Some, you know, the most common ways that, that we see are through questionnaires or surveys, but there's many other ways. There's focus groups, there's management forms, there's looking at key performance indicators in, in an organization with respect to short and long-term illnesses. Uh, there's environmental scans. There's all sorts of different ways of doing a needs assessment. Uh, so, you know, um, be creative. Uh, look at what, what works best uh, in, in being able to identify some, some key points in your organization, through your culture, you know, how, how, how can that be done through uh, the organization that's really important to tailor it, uh, to make it, make it uh, personable and make it uh, uh, appropriate for, for the culture of the organization. In, uh, you know, however the idea is, is initiated to initiate or pull together a peer support program, it's important to assemble a strong organizational planning team to carry it through to implementation. And that might be in the form of a steering committee or a working group. Members might include organizational leaders, managers, and frontline staff from various clinical departments, as well as representatives from human resources, occupational health and safety, patient safety, employee wellness, spiritual, spiritual care teams, unions, um, if that's appropriate for the organization. Uh, but it is important to, to uh, pull together uh, lots of different folks from different areas to get their perspectives. The, this uh, team in the form of a working group or steering committee is responsible for establishing the foundation of the peer support program, including the goals, policies, procedures, and business plan. They might also be engaged um, in, directly in the needs assessment, creating a work plan, a strategic plan, and implementing, champion, and evaluating the program. Establishing clear goals is really, really important for the peer support program, and it's a, con a key contributor to the success of the program. Having goals ensures that all levels of the organization understand the purpose and value of the peer support program and stay focused on what they're trying to achieve and accomplish. Some examples of goals might be to safeguard the well-being of individuals at the organization, to assist in the recovery of individuals who experience critical incident stress, to help individuals maintain or return to health, to prevent more serious occupational stress, injuries, and illness, to promote resilience, to help individuals understand that their rea reactions are normal and expected, and also to reduce absenteeism. So all of those might be examples, but again, there are many, many other examples of what might be more appropriate to the workplace and to the organization. It is imperative that the peer support program has foundational support from those in the organization who will contribute to its success. This means getting buy-in from the organizational leadership, managers, and those who will be served by the peer support program. Getting buy-in from senior leaders is not always as big a challenge as expected. Generally speaking, senior leaders and managers support peer support. But even in this current climate of promoting well-being of health professionals in the workplace, resistance can occur, and often that's due to a limited awareness of the issues and the challenges that, that are experienced in the workplace and the benefits of having a peer support program. 
Some of the tactics used to bring senior leadership on board include uh, providing evidence from the needs assessment that had been done, uh, providing those stated goals that had been drafted, uh, committing to clear lines of communications to senior leadership throughout the initial stages of the development, and ongoing reporting to keep them apprised of its progress. Uh, educating leadership about the benefits of peer support whenever the opportunity arises. Providing case studies or stories of critical incidents where staff were supported and where staff weren't supported. And just comparing the outcomes of, of those two scenarios. It could also include collaborating with the, the unions, um, if applicable and if appropriate, ensuring they understand the purpose and benefits of the program. And also, you know, it might also uh, be very helpful to explain the importance of adhering to standards for mental health. And an, ex uh, an example of that is the CSA standard on psychological health and safety in the workplace that was launched in early 2013. A peer support program should, whenever possible, be one that is inclusive rather than exclusive. And so it's suggested that peer support programs be open to all levels and all groups of clinical or non-clinical staff, and also include volunteers, students, trainees, or anyone who might be affected by a critical incident. It might be um, even experiencing stress or affected by emotional trauma in the workplace. And this is, you know, there's, there's a caveat there. As, as long as there are the appropriate peer uh, supports in place and, um, and, you know, as long as it is appropriate for the organization and, again, the culture of your organization. So how will peer support programs be activated and followed through? The process uh, to determine how the need for support is identified or how the peer support program is activated can be challenging, but is a key element of establishing the structure and procedures for the program. Decisions will need to be made that are related to three key questions. First off, how will workers become aware of the peer support program? What type of issues will the peer support program respond to? And what is the process once the peer support program is activated? How will peers de be deployed? All of those sorts of logistics. So really to summarize um, in this slide, you know, there are many questions uh, to answer and lots of considerations before a team is actually pulled together. And some of the questions are, are listed below and we addressed some of those in the previous slides. I think one of the really important things is to start slow and not rush into it. Make sure that there is that understanding from the organization around what the benefits are of a peer support program uh, and, and what the organization and the workers want to see uh, as a peer support program. There's a, a wide range of what peer support might look like and, and it's not cookie cutter and, and it's really important to get those perspectives. The amount of work involved in implementing a peer support program is, is often underestimated and I find that with lots of different discussions that I've had with people who are really very keen to pull a team together but just don't quite know how to do it. Uh, that said, if the preliminary work is done, such as a needs assessment, designing an informed selection, recruitment and training process for peer supporters, the peer support program will have an excellent chance of thriving. Um, I, you know, I tell people it's, it, the easy part is pulling the team together, the hard part is the sustainability of it the, you know, making sure that it thrives and that the peer supporters feel, feel supported and feel that they are getting, uh, you know, the resources and tools that they need. So that, that sometimes can be uh, a bit of a challenge. So let's just switch uh, topics a little bit to, uh, to focus on operationalizing the, the peer support program. Managers and supervisors need to be able to recognize the signs of distress and give clear instructions on how and when to activate the peer support program. So depending on how the team is set up, managers and supervisors might encourage their staff member to call the peer support program and would provide details on how to do that. They can also support their staff member by reassuring them that they continue to have complete trust in their professional abilities and that they are important to the team. 
our colleagues at Central Health have used Denim's five human rights uh, for those involved in a critical incident to help guide managers and supervisors in providing effective support. And those five rights are, are in that acronym TRUST, treatment that is just, respect, understanding and compassion, supportive care, and transparency. So some do's and don'ts for, for managers and supervisors when, uh, who encounter staff having experienced a critical incident. Um, as for the do's, be present as a manager or supervisor, be visible, practice, practice active listening, allow staff members to share the personal impact of their story, reaffirm confidence in their skills, offer EFAP services if that's available in the organization, and be aware of your own feelings and involvement in the incident. Uh, if as a manager or supervisor you've been directly uh, involved in, in, in the critical incident, um, it, it's important that the manager and supervisor be in a really good headspace to be able to support uh, employees, their workers. And if they themselves have been impacted, they may not be in, in, the, right, in the right space at that moment to be providing uh, that support. So just be aware of how, how, as a manager and supervisor, you are feeling. As for don'ts, um, don't con condemn or second guess their performance. Um, your role is not to be a counselor, it's, it's there to, to listen and to be able to provide the resources and support for that worker. Don't downplay their reactions or emotions and don't undermine their confidence or competency maybe by saying, oh, you know, uh, when you get more experience, this will just sort of roll off your back and it won't be a problem. I, you know, that, that's not necessarily a, a very helpful thing to, to say at the time for sure. Um, then we come to confidentiality, um, and as Margaret uh, noted at earlier, there had been um, a, a webinar on confidentiality, so just want to touch on it today, but it is generally acknowledged that confidentiality is the cornerstone of, of the peer support program. Confidentiality is especially important to health professionals who fear being perceived as vulnerable or weak for seeking mental health support and particularly with respect to patient safety incidents where they fear exposure to legal or disciplinary actions. It is therefore important to be clear in the policy and to the health professionals that the organization will make every effort to maintain confidentiality within the peer support program. It is also important that peer supporters make clear the limits of confidentiality to those they are supporting. One of the key recommendations about confidentiality is that peer support programs should maintain minimal documentation about those seeking support. If any information about the clients is collected, there are strict protocols for maintaining the confidentiality of the records, such as keeping them in a secured shared file on secured computers accessible only to the coordinators of the program. The data collected should be kept for statistical and evaluation purposes, only such as to help those responsible for the peer support program review their, their processes, evaluate trends in the workplace, and determine whether there are proactive solutions to prevent critical incidents from adversely affecting their staff. Regulated health professionals who are providing the support, and this might, this might be physician counselors, social workers, or psychologists, should consult the appropriate legal resources concerning regulations about documentation. This not only protects confidentiality of the clients, but also protects peer supporters who are using their credentials to provide the support. And with that, I will, uh, I will throw it over to Dr. Godet. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to present today. Are you, uh, everybody can hear me well? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ethian. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as a physician advisor at the uh, Quebec Physicians Health Program, which is the Programme d'Ado Médecin du Québec in French, I am a peer supporter to uh, my physician colleagues uh, who are across Quebec and sort of across also the medical career. So, uh, we see students, we see uh, residents, uh, we also see uh, staff physicians. So, it really is across, across the board. And uh, I'll be speaking about uh, the role of physician advisors. So if I could have the next slide, please. 
Um, and here I'll be underscoring some of the aspects that Brenda spoke about earlier in the webinar, but that bear uh, repeating. Uh, peer supporters really need to understand their role and its boundaries and to be committed to the values and the principles of the program that they're working within. Uh, as Brenda was saying, a peer supporter is really somebody who helps their peers to leverage their own resilience and who avoids pathologizing what can be normal reactions to stressful situations and who helps normalize also the emotions and feelings that their peers are having. Uh, I can tell you from experience that this is extremely important for my physician colleagues who consult the Quebec Physicians Health Program uh, because medical culture can tend to suggest that feeling distressed is a sign of weakness. So many colleagues uh, who come to see us actually phrase it in terms of being given permission or being validated in the fact that they are finding a situation difficult to deal with. Um, most importantly, peer supporters must really recognize that they are not providing professional psychological support. They are not clinical therapists, uh, they're, or they're not working within that role, uh, nor are they providing psychological or psychiatric counseling. So this means that they really need to avoid diagnosing or providing psychological treatment to clients uh, to determine unilaterally solutions or directing the decision of the peers that they support. Uh, peer supporters provide non-clinical emotional support to individuals in the form of empathetic support, active listening, uh, encouragement, and information about resources and other supports available to them. Um, although peer support can be offered on its own or as a complement to clinical care, a peer supporter does not take the place of a clinician and should not aim to fix a colleague. When I meet a colleague, I clarify that although I'm a psychiatrist by training, I am not acting as a clinician but as a physician advisor and I will explain my role. And then I make it very clear that if a consultation to a clinical resource is desired, uh, then that will be discussed and facilitated. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now talking a bit about recruitment. Um, the recruitment and selection process for peer supporters is really critical. So some organizations will use an elaborate process that includes nominations, references, psychological screening, and panel interviews to select peer supporters. For others, the process is less formal. Whatever the process, much thought really needs to be given as to how peer supporters' selection will be done. So an organization needs to ensure their peer support program has the right cohort of peer supporters. Otherwise, there'll be an impact with credibility, sustainability, implementation, and ultimately the success of the peer support program. So when a peer consults, they are coming at a particularly vulnerable time. If they are not comfortable with the choice of peer supporters, they will probably not want to access the service you're offering. So perhaps the idea, uh, if it's helpful, is to think of it in terms of nominating colleagues who you would actually want to go see for support if the need arose. Given the huge taboos that surround and uh, still do, do to some extent, physicians consulting for mental health problems of any nature, uh, the founding members of the Quebec Physicians Health Program decided to recruit physicians to meet with colleagues with the idea and the objective that this would bring down barriers to consultation for physicians. So, for example, at the program, at the Programme d'Ado Médecins du Québec, there's a selection process where all candidates uh, who want to be physician advisors, so peer supporters, need to fill certain baseline criteria. So we need to have 10 years experience in clinical practice to ensure that when we meet our colleagues, we have credibility in regards to a shared professional experience and, that, and all that that entails. So we have all been medical students, we've been medical residents, we've been attending staff, and we know and we understand the landscape both on a professional and on a personal level. We have a formal interview process where the CEO of the QPHP as well as the Director of Intervention uh, assess the candidates for suitability. So if there is a whole process uh, that is done here. Uh, when recruiting new physician advisors. Uh, further examples, the physician advisors here do not need to have a specific clinical background, so I'm the only psychiatrist. Uh, some of my colleagues are GPs, anesthesiologists, OBGYNs. Some of us come from community-based settings, other from university settings. Um, but the, and the peer supporters are not here uh, chosen on the basis of having had a specific traumatic experience. 
But as everyone has had their share of difficulties, um, the interviewers will be looking at how an individual has addressed and dealt with their particular issues. And they will want to be sure that the candidate to be a physician advisor is definitely beyond any reactive state to a particular stressor. Otherwise, this will not be helpful to the peer receiving the support. So in other words, a colleague having gone through a difficult critical patient event uh, with, may be genuinely interested in helping out somebody else going through that same type of stress. But if they themselves have not quite metabolized the event and its after effects, the support they give will probably be less optimal as well as being possibly unhelpful to themselves in their healing process. Um, if we move on to the next slide, which looks at supporting the supporters. So it's important to recognize that there is a possibility that peer supporters will ex also experience emotional distress from their work uh, and that they may need ongoing support. Uh, because of the emotional nature of peer support, even the most resilient peer supporters could be prone to burnout or a mental health challenge. So organizations really need to consider this and to safeguard the mental health of the peer supporter th themselves there should be a robust plan to support peer supporters. So strategies such as supervision, mentoring, ongoing training, communities of practice, as well as regular meetings for the cohort of peer supporters should really be considered as essential. Uh, as an example, at the QPHP, uh, we have a mentoring program for all new physician advisors who are paired with an experienced physician advisor. Obviously, they can also ask any physician advisor colleague for help or guidance, and we certainly don't hesitate uh, to ask each other for help. Um, we have also developed a more formal community of practice through various uh, formal activities, such as organizational rounds and a monthly learning rounds where we discuss various issues uh, that present us with challenges. So, for example, colleagues dealing with the emotional impact of medical legal issues or who present with suicidal ideation. Um, the point of these meetings, which are structured and facilitated by one of the physician advisors, uh, is to build on each other's experiences and to try to develop better ways of helping our colleagues. Uh, another example of, uh, of, of, of support is that in the context of certain group crisis interventions, so for example, when we've gone uh, to uh, do um, interventions in, in physician groups where there's been a suicide, uh, the program has organized for the physician advisors to be able to meet with a clinical resource, for example, a psychologist, to be able to debrief uh, those events. Uh, we also have a protocol in place to support a physician advisor who learns that a client, peer, they were supporting has committed suicide. So we have a lot of organizational things put in place to support um, the physician advisors. Uh, regarding remuneration, which is a bit of another uh, issue, uh, organizations will set things up differently according to their various needs. Uh, the Quebec Physicians Health Program uh, is a non-for-profit organization, and the physician advisors are remunerated for their work. So our setup is perhaps a bit different than some of the other participants in the, um, uh, in the best practices uh, working group in a, the sense that we are a non-for-profit uh, independent identity, uh, entity, I should say, uh, as opposed to being a peer support uh, organization within another organization. So with that, um, I'll pass it on to uh, Lynn, oh, sorry, to Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to start to sing, and then I thought, no, no, that's not karaoke, so <laughs> thank you. All right, um, Kelly, yeah. I will advance your slides. I'm okay. Um, I've got the um, – oh, okay, you can advance them. That's fine. Sure. Thank okay. you. So everybody out there, this has been a bit of a crisis in itself this morning, trying to get this – get on, and my computer has been glitchy, and thank you so much, Gina, because um, I thought, how am I going to wing this? But that's what we do, and we're doing peer support. Um, a lot of times it's about being creative and, and trying to strategize. Um, so I'm going to speak to uh, peer support training and as well in terms of the sustainability of the program. Um, essentially, um, the program, um, the training is very instrumental and um, as is the organizational lead. So um, 
training is an integral p- component, um, and it is important that the organizations, that we hospitals, provide specific training to the peers that are going to be supporting our colleagues, but also to our leaders and our managers and supervisors. Um, it's ideal if we can have a leadership champion, um, you know, to head up and de- defend and support the program as well um, and lend credibility. Um, peer supporters um, should be trained, obviously, before they provide or deliver any types of services. And I know that there are a number of our organizations on the committee in that that have talked about peers even shadowing after a training uh, to um, gain a little bit more experience and exposure as well. Um, so they should be provided with training that will prepare them to support their peers. This could look like individual crisis intervention, group crisis intervention, anything that would enable them to use skills um, around psychological distress and, and decompressing um, our colleagues. There are a number of external providers. Um, who provide training. Um, many, however, are not focused on healthcare. A lot of the providers have been um, really focused on first responder and frontline work that way, emergency service personnel. I think more of us are getting involved in the area of healthcare. Um, and of course, you have the panel, um, and we have a peer to peer network that we're going to be um, rolling out. And this is a great opportunity in terms of uh, capturing some more information about uh, what's out there. Um, so this is a very valuable starting point for organizations that don't necessarily have the internal resources for training. Some of the um, organizations, and some of you may be familiar with them, are the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, the Institute for Healthcare Improvements, um, so that's the Building a Clinician Peer Support Program, um, which is conducted by the Medically Induced Trauma Support Services, um, Mental Health Commission of Canada, the Working Mind Program, which many of you are familiar with, um, and the Canadian Mental Health Association. We also have the Canadian um, Canadian International um, Stress Foundation, too, um, here in Canada. It's out of uh, Hamilton. So our next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, you know, what are we trying to promote? The key to the success, really, of the program is about promotion. It's not just about the services provided. And, of course, we want to imbue in that the values and principles behind the peer support program. Um, you know, really fully describing how the program will maintain its confidentiality, including identifying any kind of limitations on this confidentiality. Um, it's key, and that's going to lend to the credibility. It's the key to assuring that staff um, are in a place that's safe for them to seek support and you know, expose their vulnerabilities. Um, it's also vital to promote the uh, peer support program as non-judgmental and inclusive. And you may want to look at that when you're recruiting your, um, your peers. Um, so that it's open to anyone regardless of their profession, their gender, their sex, their culture, um, even discipline. Um, the MITSS program also recommends um, really that the organization normalize the emotional impact of staff um, by spreading the word that PSP, so our peer support, is about normal people having normal responses to abnormal events. I think the more that we break through the stigma of seeking help and talk about this being normal is a really healthy thing, um, and it also lends credibility to the program. Um, it's also important, really, to emphasize that um, to potential colleagues or clients that the organization's leadership and management are fully supportive. Again, ideal to have a leadership uh, champion um, because they can endorse its vision and its values. Um, you know, I know that... It, uh, at SickKids, we have um, some that have even stepped forward as peers because they're well-respected in that, um, but even being behind the program is very important. It's creating a just culture um, where all those who work at the organization feel psychologically safe to seek help um, without judgment um, and where they can be um, emotionally decompressed. Really, this culture where the organization is, um, you know, supportive um, and can be um, allow for feedback, pushing the envelope, pushing people a little bit out of their comfort zone to help them, plays a key role in the success of the program. And the next slide. I almost want to call Gina Vanna. Thank you. So how to spread the word, and the promotion is a big piece of this as well. 
So the RISE program at John Hopkins recommends a sustained, multi-pronged campaign to increase awareness and trust among staff. And so there's numerous methods to promote the PSP in an organization, and I'm just going to kind of walk through. Um, you see the bullets. Um, just touch on each of those areas. So the orientation of new staff. So we have many organizations have, um, sorry, more organizations have um, orientation programs bringing on new staff, and this is a really ideal time to kind of insert slides in a deck and talk about um, the program, providing descriptions and information on how to access the peer support program, um, ensuring that messaging around the just culture is um, provided, that there's psychological safety, and you know, touching on um, national standards of psychological health and safety and leadership support, and so that this is ingrained from the beginning when we're talking to new hires. Um, educational sessions are another component, so this may be training sessions about the peer support and related topics such as resilience training, mental health awareness, um, and these can be given as standalones or in-person workshops, perhaps as web conferences, um, or part of a regular in-service training or staff meetings. Testimonials is another area, reassuring um, testimonials uh, from those who have used the services can be really inspiring and very powerful and can encourage staff to seek support. So if you want to kind of piggyback on the promotion, if you have hospital intranet, um, if you have a website, a mental health website or a peer support website, you can post those testimonials there. Um, the PAMQ, QPHP has several short, short, sorry, several short videos of physicians who encourage others to reach out when they need help, and um, this humanizes the experience for everyone. Again, it normalizes it. Um, there are also several provider experience videos available on CPSI's website that can be helpful to your organization in implementing the peer support program. The elevator speech. So this is really key too. So when you get asked, what is peer about, and sometimes you'll get asked that by somebody who's interested in becoming a peer, it's an ideal opportunity to have a bit of a script. The For You program creates, uh, has created a short description of their peer support program that leaders, managers, and peer supporters can use um, and describes um, what the program is about and gives people a brief overview of why it's important and what the support includes. Presentation, so again, any opportunity where groups can gather, so it might be nursing week, for example, um, conferences, staff meetings, workshops, M&M &M rounds, grand rounds, um, joint occupational health and safety committees, those are really important, uh, medical staff association meetings, in-services training, lunch and learns. Um, building a toolkit, like a short slide deck that people can take in or a toolkit that people can access, is, or making up a, a booth. Um, is helpful to just remind staff about the peer support program and again spread the word and promotional videos or materials sorry so organizations can develop different kind of materials brochures advertisement and in internal newsletters items like computer stickers business cards magnets uh, we have peer badges um, with our processes that are outlined on the back for the peers to look at uh, magnets um, or a telephone number and printed on them for um, on pens or that for easy access. Um, and lastly, social media. And this is information about PSP on the organization's maybe intranet or external um, sources, uh, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, or other means of marketing, um, just through social media. And it's a, again a useful way to spread the word, promote the program, and give some information and make sure everybody has access to it. So the next slide, please. Thank you. So key here now is the evaluation, because you do all this work in the front loading. Um, and then how do you tell that it's working well, qualitatively and quantitatively? How do you justify keeping it going? Um, so one of the most significant challenges really is um, evaluating because of the confidentiality limitation. Um, so, you know, we don't keep records, um, but we can keep data, aggregate data to um, bring together um, and, uh, and record this. So um, with data that's collected, such as number of peer supporters, leaders and staff train, the number of clients who contact or colleagues that contact the peer support, um, 
you know, how many are served, the number of hours of volunteer time, the cost of the program, these are all really helpful. I mean, even look at if you're using EAP in the past to deliver trauma, look at what your cost savings is in terms of not engaging them again or as often um, once you have a trauma response team up and working. Uh, look at utilization rates, return on investment, and human resource costs. Um, if other data is needed, um, and I'm thinking like um, type of incident or health issue, um, referrals that are made, um, what they access, what people access for, what are the types of issues they're coming forward with, then this data can also be used to evaluate the effectiveness of the peer support program. Um, our peer program is now on the corporate um, a scorecard um, and collecting data. So there are different opportunities. Um, it can be difficult to ask clients, um, you know, who are seeking help, our colleagues, to then turn around and evaluate it. Um, but it can be offered as an opportunity, as appropriate, and use your discretion to seek the feedback anonymously even. Um, do a quick pick survey if you can um, and or a satisfaction survey. Um, there's a tool called the Second Victim Experience and Support Tool that evaluates the critical incident um, experiences of staff members and also the quality of support services. Um, so this tool can be used to evaluate staff perceptions before and after the implementation of a peer support team. So again, that's called the Second Victim Experience and Support Tool. Um, and managers and supervisors can also complete evaluations after, a, say, a debriefing or that um, and give you either verbal or having a quick uh, three or four questions kind of survey on a Likert scale would be helpful. Um, it can also be useful to use the survey to, and give it to staff um, to find out if they're aware of the PSP. So some people are using engagement surveys uh, to ask a question. Um, and when you're asking them if they've used it, uh, were they satisfied or where's the areas for improvement? Um, so from there, um, I think that we have um, a lovely, um, our next slide, uh, lovely quote. The best thing is feeling that I'm making a difference for my colleagues in a way that is in tune with my values. And I also like one by Desmond Tutu, which says, do your little bit of good where you are, it's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. And, um, you know, effort is required. Um, where effort's required is uh, often underestimated, maybe not acknowledged as readily as we'd like, but it's definitely worthwhile. So I'm now going to pass the baton over again. Great. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. That was a wonderful presentation, and we are sorry about the technical difficulties. Our technical difficulties have actually pushed us a little bit uh, late into this presentation, so we're just going to ask you to stay on for an extra five minutes so we can try to address some of the fantastic questions that came up uh, from the audience here. If you do have to go, then we ask you to join us for the final webinar in this series on Tuesday, October 29th. Uh, and when you do exit the webinar, please complete the polling question to express your interest in joining the new peer-to-peer -peer support network and expert advisory committee. So I just want to ask Margaret quickly, um, I had a question indicating interest in developing our own organizational peer support program. Is there a way to receive continued information and guidance in that? Hi Chris, um, there will be a much more said about that at the October 29th webinar. Oh, fantastic. Can say that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are working with our partners to develop a peer support network. And the network will be set up and established. And so when you do answer the polling question, please do indicate your interest to join this network. And the network aims to provide ongoing guidance and support to organizations who wish to establish their, net, their peer support programs. And of course, any ongoing questions, issues, concerns that might come up that require some guidance. And we will, um, on the 29th, also present to you our toolkit. Um, and that toolkit is a compilation of resources, tools, presentations, um, that um, will be available to folks. It's a compilation of resources that um, I know that one of the participants had asked about. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Margaret. Uh, I do have a question for Brenda for, that came out from Miriam Wheel. Uh, does the second scope element include patient-induced injuries to staff? 
You may have to unmute uh, your microphone, um, Brenda. A, okay. Um, second scope, I'm not... Um, I believe it's the second victim element or the... Uh, the, uh, the, the so for, um, for autism, um, if there was an incident, I, I, if I'm understanding it right, um, an incident that uh, resulted in a nurse being hurt by a patient, is, if I'm understanding that correctly, then yes, that's absolutely something that, uh, that we do uh, work with and would be included um, as an incident. I suspect the question was specific to um, when we look at the scope. Um, the first one was a patient safety incident. The second was a critical incident or trauma. And the third was other work-related stresses. Perfect. Thank you both. Uh, I do have an open question. That would, This would be the last one that we take. We do have fantastic questions from Adam and from Mark. We re just received one from Cheryl. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so I'm just going to open it up to the panel and ask from Di Diana Harris. Um, is there a need or necessity for a protected space for this support to occur? Do you advise an isolated protected space, a safe space for the, for the uh, support work to happen? Does the panel recommend one? We'll start in order. So if you wanted to go ahead then, Brenda? Um, yes, if, um, we would um, recommend that they be somewhere away from another group of people and uh, you know they've got that certainly the privacy uh, to be able to have a conversation and you know not having people gawking or checking to see what they're saying so absolutely beautiful thank you very much how about you uh, Kelly um, Lynn sorry hi yes absolutely uh, it's important to, to get that individual or that group sort of away and and provide Maybe that's not always um, appropriate or, or uh, you know, can happen, but uh, whenever possible, try to get people away. Great. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was a little quiet, so I'll just say that, yes, she does agree that having a quiet space away is very important. Uh, Adrienne, do you have something to add to that? I would just definitely agree. Uh, we, our offices are not within uh, a hospital setting. We're really separate. Uh, and that's very much appreciated by the colleagues who feel that that helps also, of course, with confidentiality and the comfort of coming to consult. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And Kelly, to wrap us up? I would just echo what everyone is saying, and anyone that has um, SISM training will recognize that that is a big component um, of the model. Beautiful. Thank you all so much. And I do see we are at time. We do have some other questions. We will forward to our panelists to make sure that we do get responses out to you as well. Um, we want to respectfully thank Brenda Roos, Lynn Robertson, La Dr. Adrienne Godet, and Kelly McNaughton for sharing their time and their expertise. Thanks, of course, to all of you for taking the time to attend, even a little bit extra that we asked of you. On behalf of me, Christopher Thrall, Program Lead Margaret Mutlu, Technical Host Gina Peck, and the rest of the team at the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Thanks again to our partners for making this series possible. If you want to continue the conversation started in this discussion, please feel free to send us an email. We will forward your comments and any questions onto our speakers. You should all receive Gina Peck's follow-up email in your inbox shortly, and you can respond to that. We will also post a recorded copy of this webinar on the CPSI website in the next week or so. If you want a PDF copy of the slides, please respond to that email from Gina Peck. We remind you to join us for the final webinar in this series on Tuesday, October 29th, right in the middle of Canadian Patient Safety Week. CPSI is working with our partners to establish a peer-to-peer -peer support network and expert advisory committee. So when you do exit the webinar, please complete the polling question to express your interest in joining this network. Again, have a wonderful day, everyone, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.